Hello and welcome again to Car Church. I told Patty today I'm going to tell him we're coming. Teaching Ministries International. So here we are in our plush uh, offices here uh, with the Word of God and the Holy Spirit and just excited to be with you again tonight. You know, I have to say I really miss you when we're not able to be with you. We've had a, a period of time here where we've had a number of folks, uh, you know, that we've been ministering to live, which has been wonderful. In Nashville, we had a great conference there. And then uh, we were last week in Asheville, Nashville and Asheville, uh, ministering at a church there on Sunday night. But as much as we possibly can, we'll be here with you on Sunday night during Car Church. And we're just thankful to be with you tonight. So get your Bible, and if you have it with you, we're going to start in Isaiah 55 tonight. And I'm going to let Patty greet you, and we're just going to begin this evening. Hi. Welcome. I hope you've had a restful day today. Actually, I've had a pretty busy day today, but it was a good day. But whether you've had a restful day or a very busy day, you know, the good thing is that our God is with us always, and He never changes. So let's praise Him tonight. Father, we thank You that You never change. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that Your love for us is constant. We thank You that Your Spirit lives in us, and we are so blessed. Lord, we ask tonight that You be with Mike as he delivers the Word, be with us as we receive it, and help us. Help us to really get this into our spirit so that every day we can grow in you. And we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So if you've got your Bible, let's look at Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55, and our topic tonight is the source of satisfaction. And, uh, you know, I... I guess you probably haven't ever heard a message on satisfaction that you didn't hear a preacher talk about the song, I Can't Get No Satisfaction. Uh, I try, I try, I try, I try, can't get no satisfaction. Well, there is a place of satisfaction, but it's not in any of the places that I know for me, I looked for years to try and find it. Uh, but scripture is going to speak to us about satisfaction. And you know, I'm personally of the opinion that contentment or satisfaction is a tremendous weapon in the arsenal of a believer, contentment and satisfaction. Because if you think about it all the way back to the Garden of Eden, what led to the fall of man was really the sowing the seeds of discontentment in the heart of Adam and Eve. Because what the enemy did is he pointed out, instead of pointing out what Adam had and had access to, he pointed out what Adam was lacking and sowed the seeds of discontentment. And the end result was that that discontentment led to an attitude, the attitude led to an action, the action led to a destiny. So to come back into a place of contentment and satisfaction is really critical to be, being able to stand our ground in the days in which we're living. And by the way, the world is screaming dissatisfaction everywhere, uh, ch challenging us, calling us to be dissatisfied with everything. So this is a really important and I think a very timely word. So looking at Isaiah 55 and verse 1, we get right into a beautiful prophetic passage of Scripture, but revealing something very deep spiritually, so much deeper than what we would look at if we were just looking at the surface of the words. He says, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy, and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. And let your soul delight itself in abundance. Uh, so this first part, there's already some astoundingly deep and profound revelation here. But what we're talking about is the dissatisfaction of a life that's lived on our own terms and in our own strength. That dissatisfaction that comes from us trying to live life our way based on our ability and our capacity and our strength. 
Now, we know that that's true in regards to not knowing the Lord, but one of my great burdens is for people who do know the Lord, but they continue to try and f find their way th through life based on their own terms and relying on their own strength and their own capacity and ability. Now, it's interesting that he speaks here about the difference between something which is freely given and abundant and satisfies and something which co is costly and laborious and does not satisfy. Look what he says. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Now that's freedom and free speaks to us of grace of something that we don't earn, we don't deserve, we didn't purchase, we didn't buy. It's something that's bestowed upon us as a gift. But now he says, why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Critical word here, wages. What are wages? Wages are what somebody gets paid for doing labor. So the picture here is the picture of somebody who's doing labor and expending their energy, their strength, their capacity, their time, their talent, based on their energy, and they're obtaining something for doing that, and then they're expending that to try and fulfill a need, but they're finding that it does not satisfy. There's an emptiness, a hollowness of me living my life on my own terms and out of my own strength. I think we understand the idea of living on our own terms, most of us would know that living just out of our own fleshly, uh, you know, desires would be a, a life that doesn't satisfy. But what we don't often think about is living on our own strength, on our own ability, on our own capacity. And when he speaks of this word wages, he's speaking of human labor and human labor, human work, trying to accomplish something to bring about satisfaction results in emptiness. But when we enter into the realm of grace, now suddenly we're in a realm where satisfaction and abundance of joy, of peace, of purpose, of meaning, all of that comes to us, wine and milk, without cost and without price. It's not something we're laboring to bring forth. It's something we're receiving. Key word here. In this life that we talk about, letting Christ live his life through us rather than us living our life for him. If I'm living my life for Christ, I'm laboring and my labor brings wages and then I'm expending the wages that are the result of my labors and what I'm obtaining is not satisfactory. It does not fulfill me. But if I'm in a receiving mode, receiving the power of his life, receiving the power of his strength, allowing him to do the work through me, now I'm in a grace mode. And in that grace mode, now his life begins to live through me and I start to see the satisfaction of wine and milk without price, without cost, without wages, without my laboring. You know, Hebrews chapter four talks about this, about entering into the rest of the finished work of Christ. And he says this, he who enters his rest ceases from his own labors. Well, see, if I have to labor to get wages, to expend them, to try and meet a need in me, and I'm not talking about going to the grocery store. I hope you get that. I'm talking about the deepest needs of our life, meaning, purpose, joy, peace, hope, uh, all of these things that we're so laboring for that we, why do we buy the new car? Why do we buy the new house? Why do we have to have, the, it's because we're trying to meet a deeper need in us, okay? So he says here, I don't want you to be living on a wages laborious basis of your energy. I want you to enter into a receiving grace relationship with me that's based upon my limitless capacity and resource. You know, I think about this, even tonight coming here, you know, I did a memorial service earlier this afternoon and I just finished up some teaching uh, last week and it's been a busy time for Patty and I. Uh, we've been kind of going and, and a lot of different things, but you know, every time, even driving here, I'm thinking, Lord, I'm so thankful that what you're going to do and how you minister is, is not based upon me laboring to bring forth something and then trying to expend it. Uh, no, Lord, this is about your grace. And I'm thankful for what you're going to do. I'm thankful for how you're going to minister tonight. So I'm entered into a grace-receiving relationship, not a labor-wage relationship. 
critical idea when it comes to the concept of satisfaction. Because what he tells us here is that this labor wage thing, it doesn't satisfy. It's kind of like the woman at the well in John chapter 4, where she kept coming to the well to drink. And Jesus said to her, this well will quench your thirst, but you just have to keep coming again and again. But if you'll ask of me, I'll put a well inside of you of everlasting life, which we know comes from him. And, it, and, and then you'll never thirst again. He's speaking about a limitless supply of his life versus the limited energy of our own strength and flesh and capacity and ability. Now look what he says here then in verse 3. He says, so here's what I'm counseling you to do. Stop the wage labor approach to life and enter the grace receiving approach to life. And here's how you do it. Verse 3, incline your ear and come to me. Here, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, the sure mercies of David. Indeed, I have given him as a witness to the people, a leader and a commander for the people. Surely you shall call a nation you do not know, and nations who do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel. He has glorified you. So how do I move from, again, a wage labor dissatisfaction to a grace receiving contentment and satisfaction, it starts by me just inclining my ear to the Lord. You know, when I'm, when I'm laboring, when I'm living my life for Christ, I gotta come up with the plan. I gotta come up with the strategy. I gotta come up with the message. I gotta come up with the counsel. I gotta come up with the leadership. I gotta come up with all of it because I'm living my life for Jesus. But if Jesus is gonna live his life through me, then I got to get quiet and incline my ear to him. It's not about what I'm going to come up with. It's about what has he got to say to me through his word and by his spirit. What is it that he's wanting to communicate with me? So I got to stop calculating and start listening. Saints, I can't tell you the importance of what I just said, because I'm going to tell you from my own personal experience, Man, I know the difference between human calculation and strategic thinking and figuring and all the stuff that we do trying to come up with a plan versus the difference between that. And like this morning, I was up 4 a.m. this morning out on my back porch just listening. I didn't have a word to say to the Lord. I just was listening. Lord, what, what's on your heart? What are you wanting to say today? And you know, the Lord just will begin to speak. And he speaks to me many times just through his word. I'll be reading the word and he'll start to communicate things to me. Oftentimes he speaks with impressions in my spirit that always agree with the word of God. They never contradict and they never supersede the word of God, but they always come in agreement with the word. And so the Holy Spirit wants to speak to us and wants to communicate with us. But we're so busy, we don't incline our ear. <laughs> you know, Patty, <laughs> Patty could agree with this. There's, there's times when my head's somewhere and she's talking and I'm sitting there listening nodding my head, but I'm not listening. And I have to go back and say, baby, I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? I didn't hear what you just said. I, my mind was somewhere else. And she always says, I know. <laughs> uh, but don't we do that with the Lord? He may be talking, but we're, we're not listening. The problem is not with what he's saying. The problem is with what we're hearing. So he says to get into this movement towards receiving and grace rather than labor and wages, we have to, first of all, just be still and start inclining our ear to the Lord. He says, incline your ear and come to me. It's a movement of our spirit towards his spirit. It's a inclining of our attention, of our intention, and of our, our uh, heart towards the Lord because now we're in a different paradigm. We're not in the paradigm of, here's what I'm gonna do for you, Lord, will you bless it? We're in the paradigm of, Lord, what is it that you're wanting to do through me and how can I cooperate with it? Now that's a whole different mentality. It puts me in a listening and an inclining mode, an attentive mode, rather than a calculating strategy, coming up with a plan mode. Now he says, when I do this, he says, here and your soul shall live. I love this. I tell you, sometimes I get in deeper than I can get out of in the time we have. I'm not going to do that. But when I start to hear the Lord's voice, when I start to incline my ear to him, 
when I start to listen to what he wants to do, what he wants to do is he wants to make my soul, my mind, my will, my emotions, he wants to make them alive with his life. He wants to infuse me with the power of his spirit and his life. And when I come to him and I listen to him, incline my ear to him, and then I hear what he says, I incline my ear, I come toward him, and then I hear it. And I hear what he's telling me to do. So many times what he's telling me to do is so different than what I had planned. So many times what I would have thought was important in my strategic thinking and my mental calculations doesn't even end up on his list. But when I hear what he's saying and I say, okay, Lord, let me agree with that and let me cooperate with that, then my soul starts to come alive with the power of his life. And instead of me laboring wages, dissatisfaction, laboring more, more wages, expenditure, expenditure of energy, dissatisfaction, now I'm in a grace mode, receiving mode, satisfaction. My soul's coming alive with the power of his life. And I'm no longer spending my, my resources and my energy emotionally, intellectually, physically on things that don't satisfy but I'm learning how to get into the flow and into the river of his life. Now he goes on to say, uh, I'll make an everlasting covenant with you. And he says, even the sure mercies of David. Boy, this, this is, a, again, it's deeper than I have time to get into. But, you know, when we hear the sure mercies of David, our first thought is of King David. And that, that's accurate. That's who he's speaking about. But, you know, Jesus was called by the Jews when he arrived on the scene, the son of David. And Jesus said something really interesting. It's over in, uh, in Matthew, uh, or actually it's over in Mark. It's over in Mark chapter 12. You know, when Jesus was coming in to, uh, to Jerusalem, you know, they were crying, Son of David, Hosanna, have mercy on us, you know, Hosanna. Um, the, some of the beggars and the lepers and the blind men would cry out, Son of David, Son of David, because they were seeing Jesus as the as the person who had come after David that, that was prophesied to be the Messiah, an earthly king. But you see, Jesus was so much more than that. As a matter of fact, look what it says. Jesus is, is speaking to his disciples and the people standing around. Verse 35 of Mark chapter 12, he says, Jesus answered and said while he taught in the temple, how is it that the scribes say that Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Spirit, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, David himself calls him Lord. How is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. What was Jesus saying? He's saying it's true. I'm of the tribe of Judah. I came through the lineage. But he's saying, but I'm more than I'm more than coming through the lineage of Adam and the lineage of David. David himself called me his Lord. He was saying, in essence, I am the king of King David. I'm the Lord of David. So when it speaks about the covenant, the sure mercies of David, it's talking about more than just the covenant God made with the King David. It's talking about the promise that God made to the son of David, who was in fact the king over David, and it's to him the promises are made. It's with him the covenant was made. Matter of fact, uh, look what it says over in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, there is a powerful picture of this in Revelation chapter 5, verse 5. Uh, and I, I'm taking this little side journey for just a moment to explain something important. In Revelation 5, verse 5, it's speaking about Jesus. And it says, one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And then look what it says. The root of David has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seals. Isn't it interesting? He doesn't call him the branch of David. If David's the root, then Jesus would have been the branch. But no, Jesus was the branch of David. He was the Lord of David. He was the king over David. He was the one who preexisted David. He was the king of kings and the Lord of lords before the foundations of the earth. He was God who became incarnate. And so why is all that important? Because this promise back here in Isaiah is telling us that God is going to make an everlasting covenant with us, the sure mercies of David. 
speaking of more than the king, but speaking of the one who was the true David, the ultimate David, the ultimate king, the one whose throne would never have an end, the one who would always be upon the throne of Israel, Christ himself. And what does it say about him? It says he's given us as a witness to the people. Jesus was our witness when he came to earth of what God was like and what we're supposed to be like in terms of the dependency Jesus had upon the Father. That's the dependency we're to have upon, upon Christ. As Jesus was the branch to the Father, we're to be the branch to the root of Christ. And he says he'll be a leader and a commander. You see, Jesus isn't leaving us to our own wisdom. He's not leaving us to our own devices. He's not leading us to our own strategies. He's not leading us to our own ideas. He wants to lead us. He wants to command us. And he wants to be the life, the very life itself, that operates through us. And that's what happens when we get over into the grace mode of receiving his life rather than the labor and waging mode of expending our own energy to try and find satisfaction. Now, there's just a couple more things here. He says in verse 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found. You know what I found out about the Lord? <laughs> I, I've never gotten up any hour of the day, any place in the world, any time that he wasn't there available to me. He so yearns to be in fellowship with us. He so yearns to be the source of our life. To seek the Lord while he may be found. Yes, I do believe there will come a time where the, the doors will be closed and the opportunity of, of finding him will be replaced by the finishing work of the Lord in the earth. But that's not this time. This is the time he's available. Any time of the day or night, you can seek him and he can be found. Call upon him while he's near. He's there. He's living inside of us. Why would we go days and weeks and months without in being in constant contact with the power of his life inside of us. He says, let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts, let him return to the Lord and he'll have mercy on him. He's not going to judge us and to God and he will abundantly pardon. If we will get back into that receiving grace mode of his life rather than the labor wages mode of our works, now we're in a position, a beautiful position where he be, can pour out mercy upon us he can pour out his life, his abundant uh, grace and mercy to grant us peace, joy, wisdom, answers. I mean, he has saved me so many hours and days pursuing things that were just not his plan and purpose for my life. And I'm so thankful. Uh, and this is the life that he wants to be able to bestow upon us. By the way, look what he says in verse 8 and 9. This is again part of the prescription of finding the source of satisfaction is he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. As high as the heavens are above the earth are my ways than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So we've got to acknowledge and recognize the chasm which exists between the Lord's way and our way, the Lord's thoughts and our thoughts. So if I'm wanting to get to that grace receiving satisfaction version, versus the wages, labor, dissatisfaction version of my own ways and my own energy, I've got to be still, I've got to listen, I've got to draw near, I've got to hear what he's saying, I've got to then seek him, I've got to call upon him, forsake my ways, forsake my thoughts, and let his thoughts and his ways begin to take precedent over my own. And the result of that is fruitfulness like we can't even imagine. Look what he says in verse 10. As the snow comes down from heaven, the, uh, the rain from heaven, snow from heaven, don't return, but they water the earth, make it bring forth and bud, give seed to the sower, bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please and prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Again, I don't have time to tell you what is the word of God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. What is it that has come forth out of the heart and mind uh, and nature and character of God? His own Son, His own Son came as the Word made flesh. And that Word now dwells within us. We've been born again, the Bible says, by the imperishable seed of the Word of God. 
So his word has come inside of us. Now the word of God is living inside of us in the person of Jesus Christ. The mind, the nature, the character, the will of the Father is in us by the power of his spirit. And what does he say? That word won't return void. It will accomplish the purpose for which I sent it. Well, he sent it into us so that his word, his life, his spirit could then find expression through us. And by finding that expression through us, it won't return void, but he can accomplish through us things that we can never accomplish for him. Amen. And look at this finishing word. For you'll go out with joy. You'll be led forth with peace. What are we talking about? The source of satisfaction. The mountains and the hills will break forth before you into singing. The trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn, I've had plenty of thorns, will come up the cypress tree. Instead of the briar, I've seen the briars of my own strength and my own ways, will come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Wow, we went through a whole chapter of Isaiah, but let me just close us out by talking about this. Where is it that the Lord is trying to bring us? He's trying to bring us to that place of satisfaction. And what is that place of satisfaction? What is it that it will accomplish? It will bring us to this place of joy, a place of peace, a place where the mountains and hills are, the scripture says, birth forth and singing before us. What does that mean? It means our pathway is blessed. It means our avenue, the choices and the decisions we make the, 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 if the world starts to agree with those choices and decisions because we're in the center of seeing his life expressed through us. It speaks about instead of thorns and briars, myrtle trees and cypress trees, and it speaks of a flourishing kind of life. You know, the Bible says this, it says, the man who trusts in man, curses the man who trusts in man, he'll be like a bush that's dried up in a desert and won't even see good when it comes. But then he says, but blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. He'll be like a tree planted by a river of water, brings forth fruit in its season, in its, season. its leaf doesn't wither, and whatsoever he does prospers. What's the difference? The difference is whether I'm trusting in me, I ha actually happen to be a man. It's not just me trusting somebody else. Trusting in me and my strength, my ability, my wisdom, my plan, versus me trusting in him, his strength, his ability, his wisdom, his plan. So if I'm living my life for him, I'm trusting in me. And the result of that is a dried up bush in a desert. If I'm trusting in him, then I, my trust is in his ability, his capacity, and a flourishing tree is the result. Joy, peace, satisfaction, wine and milk without price, without cost. Saints, I'll tell you, this, uh, this word tonight to me, I just wanna say, I don't want it to just be theory to you. I'm telling you from personal experience, the wonders of his life in us so far surpass the, the desolation of our life for him that there's not even a comparison. It's the difference between light and, and darkness, life and death. The flesh, the scripture says, profits nothing. The flesh can't glory in his presence. When we operate out of our mind, our will, our emotions, our passions, our appetites, when we try and harness our flesh to, to do something for him, dissatisfaction. Our works, our labors don't bring about the desired end. But when we get into that stillness, that listening, that precious time of just letting our mind and our emotions and our will be quiet, hearing his voice, following his leadership, when we get to the place that he's called us to go, relying on his strength, saying, Lord, I thank you for what you're going to do right now. You've called me to this place, to this situation, to this particular responsibility. Now I'm turning it over to you, trusting your ability to work through me. Uh, Lord, I thank you and praise you for what you're going to do. I'm in a receiving mode. I'm in a grace mode. I'm looking for wine today. I'm looking for milk without cost, without price. I'm looking for the mountains to break forth into joy and singing. Hey, life can be hard. Don't misunderstand me. I know that. I'm, I'm one of those people that walks with people through some of the hardest times in their life. But I can tell you, even in the midst of the hardest times of life, when Christ is living through you, it's a different world. It's a different world. 
So let's close in prayer tonight with this, with this prayer. We want the source of satisfaction, and it doesn't come by labor. It doesn't come by wages. It doesn't come by the expenditure of our energy and effort. It comes by grace, the grace of his life in us, receiving that grace and letting him work through us, leading to satisfaction, joy, peace, fulfillment, lasting and enduring. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for everyone who's listening tonight or through the weeks ahead. Somebody may be listening to this a year from now. It doesn't matter. Your word won't return void. It will accomplish the purpose for which you sent it. And Lord, our hearts are yearning for satisfaction, but we get in our own way so many times, Lord. We're so busy trying to wrangle satisfaction out of our own energies and efforts and labors that we're missing out on the wonderful invitation you've given us. I think of this verse, Lord, and it just speaks to my heart as we're closing in prayer. Ho, everyone who thirsts, are you thirsty tonight? Come to the waters. You who have no money, do you have no money? No problem. Come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why would you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Lord, thank you for the abundance of your life in us versus the emptiness of our life apart from you. I thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for watching again tonight. Uh, Lord willing, we'll be back here next Sunday night uh, at Car Church. Thank you again always for those of you that comment or send us a message. It means so much to us to know that this time is helping you and is encouraging you, and we're so thankful for that. Uh, we love you all, and we miss you when we're when we those few occasions we have to take off. Uh, have a wonderful week, and we're praying for you always. God bless and good night.